So this next speaker I have a soft spot for, this is John Knapp. He's the senior island scientist for the Nature Conservancy and the founder of the Catalina Island Conservancy's Catalina Habitat Improvement and Restoration Program, or CHIRP. John's island conservation exploits are legendary, but something less appreciated is just how hard he works to bring the different island conservationists together as an archipelago to amplify our effectiveness. He is great at bringing people together. He'll describe his landscape level approach to invasive plant eradication efforts on Catalina and Santa Cruz Island, as well as the Argentine ant eradication and rare plant recovery efforts on Santa Cruz Island. So I just want to make a, a little amendment to Denise's statement. Uh, I co-developed it with Peter Schuyler, uh, Chirp. So Peter was actually the one who coined uh, uh, birds chirp and we're um, trying to restore the island. So that's kind of how that came about. It's so great to be here. I, I'm looking at all these faces and I just don't see great people. I see legacies. Legacies that I've read in scientific journals, um, legacies I've heard about over uh, a cold beverage, um, legacies I've learned from volunteering for some of your projects. So I'm, I'm really honored to be here. And I, and I wanted to share a little anecdote. Uh, part of my education, I was homeschooled, and I lived in rural Riverside County. And my dad uh, made me do a book report on a magazine article about Tiger Woods and his father. And the story was about Tiger Woods' father not letting him play with anyone that was not better than him. And that, that always resonated with me. And so I have my whole life tried to surround myself with people that are better than me. And I look out here and I'm, I, I'm in the right place. And, and the speakers, the honorees, I'm in the right place. There's someone else I wanna acknowledge who's no longer with us. And that is Norman MacDonald. You might know him from Pro Hunt or our native range. Norm was, uh, I stole what I could from Norm and implemented it in the work that I do. And Norm was this, this unique character. He was a little bit of Buddy Hackett. He was a little bit of Norman Schwarzkopf and a little bit of George Clooney. And so only those people that have seen him in various environments would have seen those different elements of Norm. But he, he was an amazing man. I wouldn't say I was close with him at all, but I learned a lot. And so I just want to acknowledge he's another great conservation hero. So today I'll be talking to you about mainly Santa Cruz Island. I work for the Nature Conservancy and we own and manage 76% of the island. Uh, it's the ancestral uh, lands of the Shumash and they call it Limwu, which means from the ocean or the mountain in the sea. Um, I'll be sharing three projects today. I'm gonna be very cursory in, in um, in describing them, so there might be a lot of questions. I've already heard some questions about ants, so uh, happy you know we can get into it uh, during the panel discussion. So, as, as you have heard from the other speakers, the introduced vertebrates and even one uh, invertebrate has been removed uh, from Santa Cruz Island. So all the mainland introduced vertebrates are now gone, and the dust has begun to settle and the land has begun to heal from the impacts of those animals. They're trailing, they're, they're turning the soil. And during that time, we were able to uh, avoid a catastrophe. And I know many of you know this story, and it's a story for another day. Today, we are talking about plants. <laughs> and I'm sure you're all aware of, uh, or familiar with uh, the nursery rhyme of Humpty Dumpty and how he had a great fall and all the king's horses and the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Well, Santa Cruz is very much like the story of Humpty Dumpty. Santa Cruz was shattered, but unlike that nursery rhyme, we are putting Santa Cruz back together again. But when I was in Mrs. Schellenberger's third grade class, when this photo was taken of Santa Cruz, this is when the Nature Conservancy got the conservation easement and par partial ownership of the island. It's, it's hard for me to, to think that the island looked like this. 
I mean, it, it looks like a nuclear uh, bomb has gone off. In the next two slides, I'll show you, uh, it's very similar to some of the other slides that others have shown, that this red line illustrates a fence line on the island where sheep were present on the left, or on the right, and sheep were excluded from the left. So you could see just a little bit of exclusion for a little bit of time of how much change can happen. Seeing this, seeing the recovery, it, it really gives me hope in the power of nature, in the of how nature can rebound. I, I think we saw that with COVID, right? As we as humans stayed in our little houses, nature was able to, uh, to get a breath. I wish I would have taken this photograph and uh, turned it black and white, because if I did, it would probably look like the moon. This is a photo of a site that was shown in many photos. Uh, Ralph Hoffman, who died for rare plants on the Channel Islands in the 1930s, collected a rare plant off this cliff. He ended up dying on, on San Miguel Island. But other than those cliff faces, these plants were eliminated off the island, and we had uh, virtually a, a clean slate. So the Nature Conservancy and the National Park Service, who co own and manage Santa Cruz Island, started to see that there was an arms race before us. There was native plants and invasive plants. Who's going to get to that, that space that the uh, sheep created and the cattle created? This graph here is, is just showing you the trends in uh, what was happening with the vegetation over time. So the sheep and cattle, as Peter talked about, were removed in the, in the 80s, late 80s. And you could see both native and invasive vegetation started to, to really get a foothold and started to occupy the land. The green line being native vegetation, the red line being invasive. And then we had the 91, 92 El Nino. And it was like giving the island a shot of adrenaline. And that seed bank got triggered and more plants started to expand, and we started getting more vegetation recovery, as well as more invasives, as Peter pointed out in his talk with fennel. And then pigs were removed around 2006. So let's look at the interior of the island, some of the recovery. This is uh, Dr. Dirk Van Vuren's uh, repeat photo monitoring. Peter has uh, his own route on the island and coming out again to, to retake those photos. But this is some of Dirk's work just showing how much the vegetation is changing. And that's, everything you see is native and oftentimes endemic. This is uh, another series, uh, a 45 year series from 1972. So it predates the Nature Conservancy uh, above. And then Wildlands Conservation Science retook these photos for us in 2017. And so you could just see how much area was denuded of vegetation and how much has recovered. But again, we have this arms race. And the fennel, this is a map of fennel on the island. To give you some perspective, this is 3.8 Santa Barbara's of fennel on Santa Cruz Island. It's not, it's not all dense, but there is fennel in this entire polygon. So Peter talked about like tinkering with, with some kind of mechanics. And I like to think about it as a puzzle. So, you know, my dad's a little wacky guy. He, you know, pulls me out of school to homeschool me. He also loves going to thrift shops and going to garage sales. And he'd always bring home these, these puzzles for us to, to play with. And oftentimes, the puzzle would have pieces from other puzzles in it. And that's how I see how the island. The island is like a puzzle. Each piece is a different species, and a non-native plant or animal is a puzzle piece from a different puzzle. They just don't belong. You know, sometimes you can force them in there, but they just don't fit quite right. So this is that same graph, but looking further into time. And you can see with pig removal, vegetation again is going upward. Recovery is going upward. But then we implemented uh, a comprehensive uh, invasive plant program. And we are uh, um, reversing that trend in invasive plants to, uh, to become lower. So 
So, sorry. So, um, wanted to give you a little bit of thinking and thought that, go, that went into our invasive plant program. We basically, there's these people that know the islands well. So we assessed, got their information, got expert opinion about what are the worst threats. Then we looked at the scientific literature. Then we took what we knew of the flora, and from there, narrowed it down to which species are invasive. So we didn't, we, uh, not all non-native species are harmful. And so we only focused on those that posed a risk to uh, the ecosystem and, and species survival. So then we surveyed uh, for those 55 species, and we got their distribution and abundance, knowing their invasiveness. And from there, we narrowed that down to 28 that we could target for eradication. So in, in uh, 2008, we began treatment of half of those. And then by 2010, we were treating the, the remaining 14 on that list. So you might have a hard time seeing the, the text in this slide, but this is a time frame of our major projects that were led by the Nature Conservancy. And it doesn't really matter what the projects are, so if you can't read it, don't, don't worry. But what I'd like to bring your attention to is what's going on here. You see that there was major project, long time frame, major project, long time frame, and so on. But then there's all these projects that start, start happening. What changed? Well, you might want to say it's the norm effect, that we took and learned from the feral pig removal project and applied that to plants. And so a helicopter is a tool that's used often in conservation, but it's how we used it. We used it very differently than most people use helicopters. We basically cut out the access time, and that allowed us to do the same work that you would do on the ground. We could do it 12 times faster. So a month equals a year's worth of work, and we could do it for half the cost. Right, you're sending two people out, buddy system safety, and instead of trudging through vegetation like you could see on the, on the right photo. Gear, you don't have to be weighted down with gear. You need a machete, you just call in the helicopter and the hel helicopter brings in a machete. More weed workers have uh, incidences with broken legs, sprained ankles, um, heat exhaustion because they're weighted down with gear that they might need. We're alert, we're fresh, we can see, you know, we're, we're, we're still looking for plants instead of trying to catch our breath. Places that you would think would be inaccessible for a helicopter to drop someone off could be dropped off with a helicopter. So here is an applicator who's treating pampas grass, um, and a helicopter put that person there. There's a rock outcrop. It was safe, but it gives you a sense of where you can go. For those places you can't go, we experimented with paintball guns filled with paintballs that had herbicide in the, in the paintballs. And we could do the same amount of work with that paintball gun uh, in four hours that it took us four days by dropping people off with the helicopter. So we're always looking for efficiencies. And that's because conservation dollars are so limited. We, if, if you're not trying to use those dollars as efficiently as possible, you are, you're hurting the environment because you're wasting money that could go to a really good project. So you always have to be thinking about how to do your project better. So this is one slide that, that really gives me hope. And this is the status of our eradication project as of 2018. It's 2022, we switched methods, so it's a little bit harder to show you in a, in a very kind of um, dashboard framework. But each bar is a species. There's 28 here. If they're black, that means uh, most of the infestations have been uh, controlled to zero density. We still know there's a seed bank possibly there, uh, but over half of these are now gone. So out of the 28, 14 of them are gone. If there's any color, that just is, shows the different age classes of the populations that are left. So out of roughly 1,000 uh, infestations, we only have 100 that are active. So we keep going annually back to these infestations to make sure that nothing has come out of the seed bank. 
And this is a map that shows you those locations. And obviously, you can see where the main ranch is on the island where you know, a lot of unintended uh, introductions have taken place, and also at Prisoner's Harbor, uh, the port of entry. So those are the same areas now that we implement biosecurity with our partners at the park to ensure that no new invaders make it to the island. So going back to that timeline, taking it another 10 years out, the same projects are ongoing. You'll see the dotted line kind of changes. That's because there's been a change in how we're implementing those projects. Doesn't really matter what they are, but I want to bring your attention to another grouping. We've added more projects. Is that because we added more money to our budget? Maybe a little bit here and there, but it's really because of this. It's because of partnership. This is when we started doing botanical work in partnership with folks like Catherine McKeatron, who held the, the, the baton for rare plants for, for 20 years, and folks at the, that have come through at the park and the legacy of the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. We're now partnering much more fully. We're partnering with our, our, our colleagues and friends down in Mexico. So as we're worried about this arms race with plants, there was a lot of resource managers, scientists that were saying, what are you going to do about ants? And some people would say, you know, how can ants, well, you know, what's the big deal about ants? How bad can they be? Well, if you take the biomass of all the humans in the world and you take all the biomass of ants in the world, ants will total 20% of the human biomass in the world. That gives you a sense of how many ants are in the world. Well, Argentine ants, there's a, there's a lot of them. And we have a, a rich ant fauna on the island, uh, across all the Channel Islands. And, and Argentine ants displace these native ants that do their ecological service, dispersing seed, caching seed, um, you know, helping churn the soil. But Argentine ants will they'll disrupt the, the, the pollination of many native plants. So you can imagine we see plants in the landscape and you think, oh, that's great. But in each flower is, an Argentine, is, a, is a horde of Argentine ants fighting off pollinators that are coming into that flower. And, and so those plants are setting less seed. And so a study done by uh, Hannah and et al looked at this on the island and, and documented that, yes, that basically Argentine ants uh, were inhibiting uh, the pollination, and so there was less seed set in, the, in these plants. And this was published in Ecology. The, this is the equivalent of John saying, hey, I'd like to have a chapter in the Bible. So <laughs> having, having you know, a paper in Ecology on something like this is, is big time. So again, we have another one of those puzzle pieces that don't belong, Argentine ants, and we need to remove it. Argentine ants haven't really been effectively eradicated anywhere before this project. There was, I think, one or two very small projects, like under a hectare or something like that. Um, and here, we have this much area. We have four locations on the island where Argentine ants are, are present. If you were to walk in any of these sites and you kicked over a rock, ants would be coming pouring out from a nest. If you walk through fennel, you would be covered in Argentine ants. So as of last year, uh, this is a joint project with the National Park Service, um, with the UC San Diego, David Hallway, um, other folks, and implemented by uh, the California Institute for Environmental Studies, CIS. We had one small nest left, and so we treated that, and as of uh, this past October, we assessed that site and didn't find any ants. That doesn't mean they're not there, uh, and we have uh, a road to go uh, to monitor these sites, um, but we don't know of any other ants that are on island, which is, which is pretty amazing. And that, in the, the way that we were able to do that is very similar to how we use the helicopter. We took something that was readily on the shelf at Home Depot and found a different use for it. So my predecessor uh, was a botanist, 
and she would take these polymers, these small granular polymers, and you put them, you mix them with your soil, and they become imbibed with water, and then they slowly release that water. Well, we needed a delivery system. You can imagine, you know, having foxes and birds and ravens. They're going to be getting into whatever you're going to put out on the landscape. But this method, uh, there was an attractant. We used sucrose, and then we used an insecticide that was watered down so the workers could take that pesticide um, to the queens in the nest. And then, um, and then by the time they know it and they're starting to feel the, the ills of the insecticide, um, it's too late. So you have to get the queens and you have to treat long enough so that any eggs that are in the nest, when they emerge, that they also have uh, bait that's uh, at the ready. So to, you know, it, it's hard to document. So, uh, you know, you, you have people in the landscape doing uh, surveys of the vegetation. You have, um, you know, putting out attractants to try to attract ants to see if they're there. And one method we tried was a dog that was trained to detect Argentine ants. And this dog uh, suffered from depression because it couldn't find any Argentine ants, right? They, they, get, they get rewarded when they find their target and they couldn't find their target. So they had to bring out Argentine ants in a safe container and hide it so that the, the dog could at least get a couple pets. <laughs> so this is uh, Dr. David Hallway's work where, you know, we're lucky to have a partner like David because he started doing his monitoring before the project was implemented. And then he's been monitoring while the project is going on, and then he's documenting the recovery. So this slide shows you have your control is the blue line, and you see the richness of, of, of uh, native ants. And then the red line is treatment, uh, um, treatment plots. And then you can see that once treatment had stopped, native ant uh, richness had increased again. So even though we're using an insecticide that kills ants, typically Argentine ants exclude native ants where they're at, but any ants that were there would be killed uh, by the control method. But shortly thereafter, their richness uh, pops back up. So another project I'd like to talk about, so we have these competing threats, right? We have invasives, we have those puzzle pieces we need to remove out of the puzzle but now we're missing some puzzle pieces, and so we want to put them back. This is 16 plant taxa that used to be on Santa Cruz. Uh, Peter had that uh, article by, uh, or, or maybe it was Denise, by Dr. Thorne, who, who um, identified the 32 species that have been lost from Catalina. These are species that we just have not seen, maybe since the 1880s, maybe as late as the uh, 1930s. And so we know a system that, is, that has native biodiversity is more resilient. We have climate change, snow on the mountains, you know. Things are changing. We need to make our islands climate ready. And so having that diversity, having that redundancy in the landscape, they might be little annuals, but we know annuals can be profusely abundant on the landscape. Annuals are very important. That we need that to have that redundancy, that biodiversity that's going to make the islands more resilient. So here's one that is gone, we think is extinct. It's a little annual monkey flower, the Santa Cruz Island monkey flower found nowhere else in the world except on herbarium sheets. A project that uh, Heather and Kevin and the audience here and myself have been talking about is sometimes these herbarium sheets have seed on them. Maybe there's an opportunity to harvest seed that could be 100, 150 years old, who knows if it's viable, to potentially reintroduce it back to the islands. And here is the Cybara, named from specimens collected on Santa Cruz that is believed extirpated. We've been looking eight years. There's been other work done by other researchers, but we have feel confident that either these species are in such low abundance that they really need a helping hand, or uh, they're gone. And so right now, what we're doing is evaluating, we can't do it all, right? Like, we're the biggest uh, conservation NGO in the world, the Nature Conservancy. We have the U.S. Navy, you know, and, and the Park Service. 
the three of us cannot do this work alone. And so we have to be very careful. We have to be, uh, you know, that goes back to Peter's talk, being very, have a vision, be very deliberate, but also, you know, uh, we have to be smart about what we, we spend our, our funds on. And so, so right now, we're look, uh, our island team is looking at these species and uh, running them through a, a, a decision process to see which ones um, will get the biggest bang for the buck if we were to reintroduce them. So what I'd like you to do is think about this conference 20 years from now. What's it going to look like? What stories would be told? This is uh, San Miguel Island. It's a cliff face, right? The donkeys, the sheep, or, uh, the horses, all the cattle that Denise talked about that Nidever introduced, they couldn't get to these slopes. This is what the islands look like. I mean, it is a botanic garden. So I can imagine when we're here 20 years from now and you, know, you pull me out of the woodwork and Heather out of the woodwork, that we're gonna be able to tell you more about how these islands recovered and show you even more prettier images than this. So lastly, I just want to thank all the TNC staff. There's just too many to name that have made these projects possible. And we are lucky that we have such great partners. These folks are intimate on each one of these three projects that I work with. They're, you know, they're just the best. They're, they're those people that are making me rise to the occasion. So I just want to, again, acknowledge David for his contribution to this uh, pr uh, pr presentation, and Morgan Ball. As you saw, most of the photos were, were Morgan. So he's a great photographer, a great thinker in conservation. So thank you to our partners. <laughs> We'll take one burning question. We don't have to. Oh, good. <laughs> what was the agent that you used to take out the Argentina? Yeah. What was the agent that you used to take out the Argentina? The, the name is escaping me. If, so if Laura or David can, uh, yeah, David. Oh, I don't know if I want to repeat that. Di diamethoxan? Yeah, so it's a neonicotinoid pesticide that's, that's very commonly used. It's a neonicotinoid pesticide. <laughs> right on. <laughs> All right. Um, save it and write it on a, a card. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. All right. Thanks, John.